Hello, my name is Dave Emery, and this is side one of For the Record program number 602, titled The Plot to Seize the White House, Interview with Jules Archer. This has been recorded on July 1st of the year 2007. It is my pleasure and privilege to bring to the airwaves, to the For the Record airwaves, uh, a man whose work served to not only inform, but to an extent inspire my own. That man is Jules Archer. Jules is 90 years young and is the author of numerous books, including, for the purposes of the present discussion, The Plot to Seize the White House. That book was originally published in hardcover in 1973, and now happily here in the year of our Lord 2007 in the United States of America, where it can't happen here, according to the conventional wisdom, that book is now out in paperback, and we can now read about that subject material. Jules, welcome to our airwaves. What was that? Welcome to the airwaves. Oh, thank you very much, David. Well, uh, it, for me, this is a really exciting interview because in addition to talking about a subject that is very important and something that's known to members of the listening audience, veteran members, but not to most people, uh, I'm going to be visiting with someone who is literally not only, to my mind, a piece of living journalistic history, but uh, again, a source of great inspiration to me. Uh, Jules, your book, The Plot to Seize the White House, was one of the first books that I read about fascism, and uh, it informed me that there was a whole lot more going on than just uh, a man with a pencil, mu a, a toothbrush mustache, hypnotizing everybody and making them go crazy. Uh, now, of course, the, the conventional wisdom has it that it can't happen here. We can't have fascism here. And yet your book is about an attempt in 1934, in the early years of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal, to institute fascism. And I thought, by way of opening up the discussion on the book, The Plot to Seize the White House, tell us about the central figure in your book and the man who was chosen to lead the coup. Tell us about Major General Smedley Darlington Butler. Tell us about his career. And in particular, how is it that this extremely patriotic man, uh, what was it about this patriotic man that inspired the conspirators to choose him as their man on the white horse to lead the, the uh, coup plot? That's an interesting question. Um, Smedley Butler was a Marine general uh, who was twice awarded the uh, Congressional Medal of Honor uh, for bravery and uh, outstanding leadership. Uh, he, he was, one, one thing you had to know about him was he was tremendously popular with the enlisted man in the Army, Navy, and Marines. He, he was the man who would visit the wounded in the, in the hospital after the wars were over. Uh, he was very concerned for the enlisted man, and he generally took his part against the the uh, brass, the uh, military brass, and that was well known throughout the army. And one reason he was cho chosen to to lead the uh, America into fascism was his popularity. He was the most popular general, uh, and he had the faith and belief of all the enlisted, enlisted men. And they felt if, he, if anybody would able to raise an, an army of um, a, a, a rebellious uh, army to take over the government, it would be Smedley Butler, not MacArthur, who was the first choice of the plotters, but they decided against it because he was in bad, bad repute with the military men because of his action in disp dispelling the Bonus Army in 1920 that came to Washington to demand the butler, the bonus for veterans that had been promised during World War I. And um, they knew that he, he could never be a popular figure or uh, get thousands of men behind him the way Butler could. That's why somewhat reluctantly they chose Butler, even though they were a little doubtful about uh, how cooperative he would be. Um, 
Uh, now, this coup plot, before we get to the subject of the bonus and the gold standard and how the plotters plan to sort of hoodwink or indoctrinate the rank and file of their would-be fascist army, who were the main conspirators? Who were the movers and shakers of the plot? Who the movers were, of the plot were right. the uh, wealthy, the uh, financiers and industrialists of the United States, the chief ones. And they were opposed to uh, Roosevelt's uh, New Deal program. Roosevelt tried to reform the, the economy, economy uh, which was in bad shape. And he introduced a new deal, which um, promised better wages, uh, support for unions, and new laws to protect the consumer. And these were laws which, which, which were anathema, anathema to the industrialists and financiers. And that's why they wanted a fascist state like Mussolini or Hitler had. So these were some of the most powerful, wealthy people in the United States. People like the Morgans, the DuPonts, and, uh, and, and some of the power elite of the United States. Uh, and they, were good. they chose Smedley Butler specifically because of his popularity with the troops. Uh, Jules, we made, uh, you, you talked about the bonus from World War I. Uh, in, in attempting to understand, or in, in, in explaining to the audience how the coup plotters were taking a popular, sort of populist general and having him represent uh, a fascist coup plot to the rank and file who were to be seduced. Tell us about the bonus. and Explain what yeah. happened in World War I and how did the gold standard fit into the way the, the conspirators were trying to hoodwink Smedley Butler and the men that they wanted him to lead. Well, uh Roosevelt took the dollar off the gold standard, meaning that it, the money was not backed up by gold bullion. And this uh, hurt all the millionaires, the wealthy and the industrials, because they're afraid it devalued their, their fortune. And they wanted the money to go back on the gold standard. And they wanted the, one of the things they wanted Butler to do was to advocate going back to the gold standard and they offered him a lot of money to do it. He wouldn't do it. And so the idea, basically, the, the soldiers from World War I were promised a bonus. They didn't get it. Douglas MacArthur was used to break up the bonus marchers who were demanding what they were promised. And then in order to get the coup attempt started, the plotters wanted Smedley Butler to make a speech putting the U.S. by advocating restoration of the gold standard so that the bonus marchers would get a solid dollar. That's the way they were going to pitch this to the, to the plotters. Now, uh, Jules, the people who were plotting this coup, people like the DuPonts, uh, people like the Morgan interest, Thomas Lamont, they admired European fascists. Tell us about their admiration for people like Mussolini, Hitler, uh, the Croix de Feu in France, specifically, they, they admired that. Tell us about what the Croix de Feu was. Tell us about their admiration for European fascism and why they admired fascism. Because uh, the uh, wealthy interests in the United States uh, saw fascism as a way of protect, protecting their fortunes and their power. And uh, they wanted to have what Mussolini and Hitler had in Europe. They sent their representative, McGuire, to Europe to investigate. And what he found was he, he thought that the Americans would never go for a fascism uh, like Hitler or Mussolini had. But he found in France an organization called the Croix de Feu, which uh, was consisted of uh, uh, French officers, officers, and they used the, this organization to break strikes, and that appealed to the American uh, wealthy because uh, they were anti-labor. Right. The, uh, the Croix de Feu also worked with the Cagoul eventually to help subvert France after the German invasion. Veteran listeners to this program will have heard discussion of the Croix de Feu. 
in uh, some of the miscellaneous archive shows and for the record programs discussing that. Uh, Jules, uh, some of the names of the people who were working with Smedley Butler. I'm going to mention some of the key operatives of the plot, not necessarily the big names known uh, to uh, students of industry and finance like DuPont and Morgan, but you made a reference to Gerald Maguire. Let's run through the nomenclature of the people who were actually involved. Who was Gerald Maguire, and what was his role in the plot? Gerald, Gerald Maguire was a, 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 broser, a broker, a Wall Street broker, who represented the J.P. Morgan interests, and they represented him for the Legion as well. So he was the stooge, the front man for the uh, American Lib Liberty League, which was the big organization behind the plotters. Now, uh, the Liberty League we'll get to in, uh, in a minute, because that's, that's a subject of discussion uh, in and of itself. Uh, who was Robert S. Clark? Uh, somebody who's actually served with Smedley Butler in China. Robert Clark was a uh, millionaire heir of the single mach sewing machine fortune, and uh, he had served with uh, Butler in China as a lieutenant, and he was used uh, as a contact man for the League, the Liber American Liberty League. He, he represented Remington Rand, uh, DuPont, Pugh, the uh, Philadelphia industrialists, mm -hmm. uh, all of whom were involved in the plot. Grayson M. P. Murphy, uh, another of the plotters, but a name not known to most people today. Tell us a little bit about Grayson M. P. Murphy. Grayson Murphy was a Wall Street, he was the Wall Street broker who represented the J.P. Morgan uh, bank interests. He was a member of the, uh, a director of the bank. He he was a uh, uh, top man. He, he was uh, he also had helped to develop the American Liberty, the American Legion. His money. Let's let's uh, talk a little bit before we get to the Liberty League. Now, the American Legion, Jules, uh, is known to most people as a, a benign organization, which it is today, that provides honor guards for Fourth of July festivities, etc. It's a veterans organization. But in its initial, in its in the beginning, right after World War One, the American Legion was something very different. Tell us about the the uh, American Legion in its beginnings, and how how did this fit into the coup plot? How did the American Legion fit in? The American Legion originally was a strike breaking unit. It was used to break strikes and anti union activity. It is not the American Legion of today. Many there have been many changes. But at that time, it was a corrupt organization headed by incompetents who did not represent the veterans. One of the things that you do uh, in, in the book, Jules, is point out the split between what you describe as the royal family of the American Legion, the leaders, and the rank and file. The leaders wanted to use Smedley Butler because he was popular, but they wanted to use him for undemocratic purposes. A lot of the rank and file, however, supported Butler against their leadership. Uh, I'm not sure uh, which was for them, except that there was a split in the Legion yeah. to who should be chosen, and they finally decided on Butler as the only man who could do the job for them. They didn't realize that they picked a guy who was a totally pa patriotic American who played along with him until he got the whole story of the plot, then he exposed it. Right. Yeah, Butler Butler was uh, was basically stringing them along. But eventually, I did, it, for, for younger people who know nothing about the early history of the Legion, early on the American Legion was envisioned as something like the Quad de Feu. It was envisioned as a grassroots, you know, well, basically like the Coal and Iron Police. It was like a Quad de Feu. It was sort of a proto-fascist organization. That is not the American Legion of today. And one of the things you point out, Jules, is how the American Legion of today evolved from those legionnaires who supported uh, Smedley Butler against the elitists. Yes, they were split in the American mm -hmm. Legion. The w one thing, at, when they got Paul Conley French, uh, a reporter for the Philadelphia Inquirer, who mm -hmm. uh, arranged to follow up on Butler's uh, charges, charge so he could support 
what Butler was saying. They were candid with him. They thought he was a supporter. And they said the dumb American people will go for the, the plot to see the White House, which would be a move to save, save democracy and support the Constitution. They said the dumb, dumb American people will go for it. And uh, you made a reference, Jules, to the Liberty League. Now, who were the Liberty League? Tell us about who they were, because they're central to the story. All, all the wealthy industrialists, uh, armaments, manufacturers, and financiers in the country. They were the most powerful men in America, and they wanted a fascist Amer America instead of a democracy because the fascist America, they would be able to control. They were offended, and they considered Roosevelt a traitor to his class. He was a well-born born diplomat, and uh, they, they felt that he had betrayed his class by going against them and introducing legislation which was for the, the common man instead of the wealthy interests. That's so, why they wanted fascism. So the Liberty League was the formal organization of the coup plot. That was the domestic uh, grand fascist council, so to speak. Yes. The, the American Liberty League was a formal organization of these people. And, uh, uh, actually, McGuire had told French that watch the space, and, and in a few weeks, a powerful organization composed of very important people is going to come out in support of this move to take over Washington. Mm. And that then the American League uh, suddenly announced its formation. Uh, Paul Comley French, again, of the Philadelphia Inquirer, was one of the people I, who broke the story. Tell us more and again about Paul Comley French. Paul Comley French was a, a crack reporter for the Philadelphia Bull and the New York Post. And he was assigned... Butler went to the air editor of the pa paper and uh, to ask that a reporter be assigned to, to follow this up and, and, and get all the information that he had so he would be supported. And they chose French, who knew Butler and uh, had worked with him before. Now, Smedley Butler, again, was chosen by the Liberty League chosen by Gerald Maguire, acting for interests like the Morgans and the DuPonts to lead a fascist coup. Jules, tell us about what he did instead. How specifically? You've told us about Jules, about uh, Smedley Butler and his work with Paul Comley French, who was assigned to him by the Philadelphia Inquirer. Tell us specifically, though, how Smedley Butler betrayed the coup plotters. What did he do to betray the coup? But the Brigade by going to the American the uh, the, um, the committee uh, the McCormick Dickstein committee, which was supposed to investigate communist and fascist activity in the United States, and he reported the whole plot to Dickstein. And uh, when I talked to Dickstein, he told me that Butler had played along to, with the with the uh, outfit to get as much fact as he could before. It, revealing the plot. So basically, Smedley Butler pretended to go along with it, but really blew the blue, he, he betrayed the conspirators to a congressional committee, to the McCormick Dickstein Committee. Now, by the way, McCormick is former Speaker of the House from Massachusetts, Representative uh, from Massachusetts, oh. John McCormick. Jules, tell us about now, Smedley Butler pretended to go along with the coup. He then went to the McCormick Dickstein Committee, again, uh, a, a congressional committee in charge with investigating communist and fascist activity. What did the McCormick Dickstein Committee do? How did they go about uh, their investigation? They had investigators um, infiltrating the various organizations which had fascist um, connotations. McCormick told me that uh, basically they were investigating communist and fascist activities, but, but emphasis on the fascist thing was that so as a real threat, whereas the communist thing was, the, was not. So basically, they, the McCormick-Dickstein Committee had infiltrated the various fascist organizations. They had uh, 
secreted people inside to investigate from the inside. I'm not sure how their investigator was carried out, but it was carried out, and they, they issued a report uh, substantiating all the claims that Butler was making mm -hmm. and that French substantiated. Some of the other people, who was uh, some of the other people involved with the case? Can you tell us about Hanford McNider? McNider was uh, <laughs> a, a general that he had been one of the men considered for the, for the leadership of the plot, but he had, didn't have the popularity or support of the common soldier. Rather like MacArthur, although they they trusted yes, MacArthur. MacArthur. MacArthur was in definite disfavor because they would have preferred him above all, mm -hmm. except that he had no no say with the uh, communist soldier or sailor. Who, they all hated him for chasing the Bonus Army out of Washington. One of the interesting things about, uh, now again, the Bonus Army, was the group of World War I veterans who had assembled in Washington demanding that they be paid the bonus that the government promised them when they enlisted That's for right. duty. And Congress, Congress uh, wouldn't uh, uh, grant it. And so basically they assembled asking for what they were promised. That's and right, and that's, that's what uh, uh, Butler was telling them to support. Mm -hmm. and, and then eventually... And they were entitled to. And it was MacArthur who led the military crackdown on the, the, the so-called bonus army. And uh, and that's where that's where the plotters felt that Smedley Butler could prove popular, as opposed to MacArthur. Uh, Jules, uh, you were one of the few people ever to write about this, other than some people whom you've written about, and other than some people known to the audience, people like George Seldes and John Spivak, and of course eventually yourself. People didn't write about this. Uh, can, can you tell us a little bit, tell us about how the mainstream media handled the case. Tell us about Time Magazine, the New York Times, and the other mainstream media. The first information I had of the plot was from George Seldes. He, he had published a little newspaper called In Fact, which published all the facts that the major media suppressed. And uh, he had this the facts of the plot in there, and I followed up on it and developed it. He was a, a respected journalist. Seldes, by the I, way... I, I, sp I spoke to him so, mm -hmm. uh, so, so several, several times, and he was very determined that the American public should lo learn about the plot to seize the White House. He thought it was very important uh, and very dangerous that uh, if it weren't stopped or known, America could turn fascist. Indeed. And, uh, and no longer be a democracy. So George Seldes, a name known to members of the audience, was one of the people who, along with yourself, uh, helped to get the word out. Uh, Jules, you write about John Spivak, and he came across testimony that uh, was... Well, uh, suppressed. In other words, the McCormick Dickstein Committee's public admission about what was going on differed from what they really knew about what was going on. And you make a point that John Spivak helped to uncover information that proved that, the, that Smedley Butler was right. The, the, when the report, uh, when the McCormick report was ex issued, certain facts were suppressed. Sully didn't know why, and McCormick, I asked McCormick about it, and McCormick denied that anything had been suppressed in the report. So as McCormick claimed that nothing had been suppressed, but Spivak uncovered the fact that, yes, it was. Yes, Spivak got the notes uh, from the committee's hearings, and he found facts that had not been reported. And what he found, basically, uh, if I'm not uh, mistaken, what he basically proved was that Smedley Butler was right, that some of the most powerful people in the country oh, absolutely. had plotted to overthrow Franklin Roosevelt and set up a fascist government in America. Absolutely. That's, that's absolutely right. Uh, so between Spivak and Selby's, they had the whole thing down pat. And yourself. And yourself. 
<laughs> myself, yeah. That, uh, and, uh, and happily, you have brought this to us, uh, courtesy of the book, which I read in its hardcover edition back in 1973, and now Plot to Seize the White House by Jules Archer is out in softcover. Jules, tell us about the softcover book. Who publishes the softcover edition? A publisher named Sky Hack, Sky Skyhawk. Skyhorsepublishing.com, yeah. Skyhorse Publishing at Skyhorse.com, or is it Skyhorsepublishing.com? Skyhorsepublishing.com. Very good, and of course people can find the book on Amazon. Yes. Uh, and people, if they wish, can also uh, order the book uh, courtesy of, uh, as they used to say in old-time radio or old-time television, wherever fine books are sold. You know? Yes. And uh, a very fine book it is. Uh, we have been visiting with Jules, uh, Jules Archer, uh, the author of The Plot to Seize the White House. That book, and again, this is something of a, a bit of perfect, revisiting some of my, my own past here. Because your book, Jules, helped to inspire my life's work. And uh, it is, it's, it's very thrilling to me to uh, be able to speak with you after all this time and after the book that you wrote and published so many years ago has helped to shape my life and now it's out in paperback. Yes, so, thank you. And uh, I just want to thank you for your life's work and for publishing The Plot to Seize the White House. I appreciate that and uh, I think it's very important that the uh, um, not only that the public learn about this but that it be taught in the schools too. It should be in the school textbook, so uh, for a complete history of the United States and the role, role that uh, General Butler played in saving the country. Yeah, he it, really did. He did. General Butler, by the way, was a two-time winner of the Congressional Medal of Honor. Yes, and, and he was actually a Quaker. He what? He was a Quaker. Yes, he was a Quaker, and uh, he was opposed to war. Mm -hmm. Later on. Um, after he resigned uh, as a, uh, as the head of the Marine Corps, he, uh, he he came out against all wars. Iraq. He wrote, wrote a book called "Waters Waters a Racket," mm -hmm. and uh, he thought it was criminal to waste human lives uh, on policy decisions of a government. Sure, sure. Well, uh, Jules, it has been a pleasure visiting with you. We have been visiting with Jules Archer, the author of The Plot to Seize the White House, now republished in paperback by Skyhorse Publishing. Jules, it has been an honor to have you on the program, and thank you for your life's work, which has helped to inspire mine. For Jules Archer, this is Dave Emery saying thanks for listening.